Oh, that's good. That is good. Man, I hope you love coming here, because I do. I, I, I'm, I'm not like being the lounge lizard out there saying hi to people. I actually really love you guys. And this is like the highlight of my week, saying hi to you all, and then seeing some people come back after a bit of an absence. Oh, my goodness. It's like, come home. Welcome home. And for those of you who are visiting who are guests with us, I hope you see the family, the love here, and the community because this is such a huge part of who we are. It is good. It is good to be here with you all. And uh, uh, we are entering into uh, a lot of things. January, January is like fall uh, 2.0. A lot of things start up again. And uh, we are going to try and have a prayer and fasting week every January of the year. So this, we're trying to uh, get this going. And uh, what happens is there's three things in this week. It's, it's happening this next week. Number one, I want you to try a day where you try to fast from something, a meal, a whole day of meals, from your phone or an app on your phone. I want you to try that, just to try the spiritual discipline of fasting. We're going to talk about it a little bit so we can dig into it more then. And then I want you to visit our prayer room. We've uh, decorated up our boardroom into a prayer room, and it's beautiful. Even if you're there for 10 minutes just to sit and to pray, the instructions are there. And it's open from 10 till noon every day through this next week, and also at night, 7 to, seven to 9. So just come and, and spend some time in prayer. And then to culminate it all off, we have our prayer summit at, uh, on next Sunday night. Not this Sunday night, but next Sunday night. I believe... That prayer is the engine of this church. I can say all kinds of things up front, and you can go, okay, yeah, that was good. You can go and enjoy the music, but to have your life transformed, it happens through prayer, through trusting God to move in and through you. And so uh, I hope you can join us. I hope this will spark a prayer life in you. We have little fasting and prayer booklets by our communion table Take one, and it will help uh, start you thinking about how to do this. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thanks so much for your goodness to us. I love you, Lord. I love the community. I love seeing friends. I love seeing new friends. God, it's, it's just good. And these dear people have taken hours out of their morning to come and meet with you. God, I pray you'll build their anticipation. I pray that you will meet with them through your message, through the worship, through the community, at the communion table, in the prayer corner. I just pray that you will meet them in whatever way they need. I ask this in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Amen. Well, we're in the middle of a series called Shaping Me. And the idea of shaping me is that we're all being shaped every single day. That's the one point I, I, we, I'm going to hammer at again and again. I think slow and steady, we're becoming different people. And you say, hold on, no, no, I'm the same person. Here, I want to ask you, are you a different person than you were in high school? Now, if you're just in university, you might not say, and, but just, are, you, are you a different person than you were in high school? I'm, I'm really different than I was in high school. Are you a different person than you were in college or university? I would say yes. I think most of us would say, yeah, that's true, isn't it? I was really this way back then, and now I'm this way. Well, the thing is, something's shaped you to become a different person. And, and can we all admit that over the last three years of this thing called the global pandemic, like, have we all been shaped in some way? Have we, has, has anxiety levels uh, just skyrocketed? Have the whole idea of safety, uh, depression just continued to, to, to rise? I believe there are things that shape us all the time. All the time. It didn't happen by accidents. You're shaped by the stories we believe, the habits we have, and the people we are around. And the, the question of this whole series is this. What would this year be like to be intentionally shaped by our loving creator. What would that be like? What th I want you to dream about what that would be like. He says, if you walk with me, if you are shaped by me, you will become a loving person. You will actually have love for people that you never thought you would have had love for about five years ago. Wow, that's really, you have shaped me, God. You have given me moments of joy when I never thought I would have another moment of joy again. But you have shaped me. I have peace in situations that are so difficult, so difficult, and it has to be you, God. 
wouldn't it be great to be shaped, intentionally shaped by our loving creator? So we're going to touch on those four ways over six weeks. And uh, week number one, we talked about we are shaped by our internal stories we believe. In fact, there's things that happened in our past that have planted stories in us that the evil one pokes at. And as the evil one pokes at us, we start to believe those internal stories. And, uh, and in fact, we, we just talked about self-talk as a window to the stories that we believe. And God in his power inside of us can, has the power to switch and change those stories. Uh, in Romans 8, 6, it says, For the mind set on the flesh is death, but the mind on, set on the spirit is life and peace. If we can set our mind on what the Holy Spirit is telling us, it's life and peace. I emailed the story out to our partners, but uh, it was a great one. This uh, One of our partners said, yes, uh, uh, you know, in the past, uh, somebody at their work had said some negative things about them, how they weren't good at their job. And could you imagine if, if somebody said that to you? Like, it, it just wore at them, and it wore at them in their sleep again and again. And yet, at, after, after our series, this wonderful guy, he said, okay, God, what do you want me to think? Spirit of God, what would you say to me? And the thoughts that came to his mind, no, you are who you are. I created you for this. You are good. All these things that came from God just took away that anxiety, took away that focus on everything so negative. We are shaped by the internal stories we believe. Uh, and so we said one of the takeaways of week number one was interrupt our anxiety with prayer. You have anxiety? You start to okay, interrupt. Hold on, hold on, anxiety. Okay, God, what do you want me to think about this? Do we just got to try it? Let's just try it. It is awesome and wonderful and shows the power of God. Spirit of God, what would you have me think? Last week we talked about external stories that come at us. They give us these life maps that are wrong. These life maps that lead us in unhelpful directions. We talked about little t truth. What's true for me is true for me, right? It's true for me. We all believe that. We all get that. Little t truth is out there. For, for, for example, I know little t truth, all right? Uh, cats are better than dogs. It just is true. It just is true. I'm, I'm sorry if you believe otherwise, but the truth will set you free. All right? I, it's just like cats are better than dogs. You have to woo a cat. You, you know, it's like, dogs, come here. And they come here. They're so obedient. Cats, you know, no, no. You have to build this, really, you know, this trust. And finally, they purr. They vibrate. Good. They're good things. All right. Tea is better than coffee. <laughs> I knew I would get some response from that. All right, all right. Okay, just this morning, I went and visited Starbucks. I don't know why I go to Starbucks, because their tea is more expensive than everywhere else. But I ordered tea. I went in for a tea, grabbed my cup. They said, this is you. I, they even had my name on the thing. Evil, evil. I took a sip. It was coffee. Ah, I spewed it out, like, like, like in the movies. Ah, mouth rot. Ah. Okay, so that is true for me. That's little t truth. That's little t truth. In other words, there are some things that are true for you that aren't true for other people, but they're still true. There is also a big t truth. It is true no matter what I believe. It is just true. You can believe it's not true, but it's still true. Two plus two is four. And that's just, you can believe it's six, but no, it is unyielding. It is just true. I remember this one young lady came up to me. Uh, for a prayer, and she said, Dave, Dave, uh, you know, uh, I think I'm kind of pregnant. <laughs> and I go, you know, internal voice, I'm very kind. Okay, let me pray with you. Let me help you, you know, talk, uh, talk with parents and help you play, pray this one through. Internal voice, you can't be kind of pregnant. <laughs> Either are you're not, right? Either one or the other. This is like, uh, this is called big T truth. It's interesting, a lot of us, because culture says there is no God, and if there's no God, there's no big T truth. It's whatever you want to believe is open season. But we as believers, as Christians, and if you're on your way to God, if you're not a believer, welcome. This is a good place to at least hear the other side of the story, right? I'm glad you're here. I'm glad you can take this in. So if you're, if you're, if you're on the way to God, if you're not a religious person, you know, the idea that there is a God that might actually have opinions about things, starts to change the idea of what Big T Truth is. For instance, for instance, I, uh, I had a friend a long time ago said, Dave, Dave, I'm making up my own religion. 
Cool. Cool. All right. Do you give offerings to yourself? Okay, no, no. To, what, what's your religion? Well, I kind of like, you know, this part of Christianity, and I got the, the bead thing from Mary, and, you know, I got the meditation from Buddha, and, uh, you know, I was, oh, yeah, I got a prayer rug from Islam, and I'm like putting this all together. And he had, he had it all drawn out in the sheet. It's like really cool. He tried to think of every religion possible. I tried not to. I say, well, you didn't get Harry Krishna in there. Anyway, um, as I looked at the map, I had one question. All right, one question. What if it's not true? It's like he never thought of that. It's like, well, no, 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 no. What if you got it all figured out, and you live your life by that, and then you reach the other side, and, and you find out it's not true? Whoa. <laughs> That's weird. That's weird. And then he said, but, but you really can't find out what's true on this side of the grave. Uh, that's a whole other sermon series. Uh, to, hold on. We'll get to that some, some month. But it's interesting. A thought experiment. If there is a God who has opinions on how we act, you think he might actually have some opinions, and maybe his opinions are the most important thing in the world. No matter how you feel about it, I believe, and as Christians, we believe, that God has given us a life map. In fact, I know this sounds so bad, but we believe because he's the creator, he gave us the correct life map because he made life. Now, if you don't believe in God, you, I'll let you be skeptical about that. I get that. That's great. You don't have to believe that. But those of us who are believers, those of us who have stepped into the family of God, we believe there's a God. We believe not only to God, but he gave us the correct life map. The world presses on us to believe wrong life maps, wrong life maps. And we don't even see it. We don't even feel it. We don't even know what's going on because it's fed to us all the time. As one, uh, two fish were swimming through the ocean, one older fish said to the younger fish, said, so how's the water? And uh, the younger fish said, what water? Uh, th the idea is we're in this, this society, this culture. We don't even know that we go to church every single day, that we're preached to every single day, no matter where we are. As believers, as Christians, again, if you're not there, thanks for coming. This is awesome. But you get a little inside voice, of a picture of, of why we believe what we believe. The Bible tells us there's three sources of evil. Where does evil come from? That's called the world, the flesh, and the devil. In other words, there are things, spiritual entities that can tap you on the shoulder. You know those cartoons with the little devil on one shoulder? And you know the, you know, the, the angel on the other one? You know those ones? All right. Yeah, you, you go. You go, like I said last week, you go and get a bag of milk, right? <laughs> if this is being broadcast in the United States, that would be like a bo box of milk. Anyway, you go and get a bag of milk, and then, and then you pass by the cookies and the cake. And the little devil says, go and get the cookies in the cake. And the angel says, no, you're going to have to exercise that off. And you know there's that battle, right? So there's deceitful ideas. But the problem is, you know what the problem is? Those deceitful ideas play to our disordered desires, the flesh. In order, the Bible says, not all of us is perfect. Not all of us is perfect. In fact, isn't this true? Isn't this true? We are Beautiful people. We are intelligent people. We have the image of God stamped on us, but we're all broken people. Can we admit that? And because of that, sometimes, not all, but some of our desires, some of our feelings, some of our thoughts are broken. The problem is some of those broken things are just normalized by the sinful society that presses on us. So that's catch-up. That's a long introduction. But I'm going to tell you one thing, one thing, uh, of this whole life map that's going to help us with the next, next thing we're going to be talking about. It's the idea of freedom. 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 Freedom! All right. I grew up on Disney movies. All right. Disney movies. Do you know that Disney movies, the theme of freedom is in almost every single one of those? All right. They are. I, I just, the first one that came to mind. A whole new world. That's why I'm not on the worship team. All right. Tell me, princess. When did you last let your heart decide? Oh, princess, you have not been letting your heart decide. All right? No one to tell us no or where to go. Oh, Aladdin, you are just going to get that girl in trouble. Anyway, I, brave heart. Come on, the, the men in here. Brave heart. Yeah. All right. 
paint yourself blue, walk around and kill. All right, kill things. Right? At the end of Braveheart, and they're killing him. All right? I don't think he was saying this, really. But because the movies tell us this is what happens, you know what he screams? Freedom! Why? Because we are being taught about freedom all the time, all the time. There's different stories behind what freedom is. Biblical freedom is always freedom from, freedom from tyranny, freedom from slavery. We're going to be freed from something. Biblical freedom is freedom from evil. The world's freedom is to do whatever I want. I get to do whatever I want. There's no rules I have to follow. I'm free to be me. The Bible calls this kind of freedom slavery. It, why? Why? Because not all of our desires are healthy, good, or right. Because if I just want to be me and all about me, and sometimes, not always, sometimes that is not helpful. Uh, I love it when uh, new Christians are reading the Bible, and they come and read a story, and they go, Dave, Dave, what am I supposed to think about this one? Okay, read the book of Judges. No, don't do it just yet, all right? If you're new Christians, hold off on that. Read about Jesus a little bit first. All right, book of Judges, the last, the last story in the book of Judges. It's nuts. Can I just say that? It is R-rated. I don't know how they ever teach this in children's ministry, but they shouldn't, all right? They should hold off until, I don't know, college or something. It's just like a messed up story. And it's about death and concubines and, yeah, things going all around the country. I'm not going to say anymore. And you say, well, why does the Bible say that? Is the Bible just this crazy book of crazy stories? Well, it's interesting. At the very end of the book of Judges, this is what it says. And everybody did what was right in their own eyes. And everybody did what was right in their own eyes. I, I think it's right. I feel it's good. And so I just did it. And they sort of played that out to, wow, it gets pretty crazy. Then as Christians come by, and again, if you're not a believer, this is a good thing to know. To become a Christian, you actually have to believe that Jesus Christ died and rose again. That's important. You need to confess that, that, that there's sin that he needs to get rid of. That's hard. And then there's the last one. You need to commit your life to him as Lord. <laughs> you know what Lord means? He gets to be your boss. And a lot of people go, well, no. I, want, I don't want anybody to boss me around. In fact, in fact, it's interesting. When you rate, hit a verse like this, Luke 9, 23, and this is Jesus. He said, then he said to him, whoever wants to be my disciple, I want to follow Jesus. Jesus is cool. I like him. Must deny themselves. Take up their cross, the way to, to die daily and follow me. Thing is, Jesus is such a beautiful master. He's awesome. He's, he's loving and kind and, and he wants our best. And so he is the best master to follow. I had heard that there's different levels of, of words in, in the New Testament. And one is called bond slave or bond servant. Uh, Paul introduces himself in Romans 1.1. I'm a bond slave of God. I remember looking that up because I heard a song about it. And the song was just so compelling. It made me weep all the time. Okay, what happens if you're a slave of somebody, you've bought your slave, uh, your, your freedom, or you've not only bought it, but maybe you spent enough time, you worked off whatever you had to work off, paid off your debt. Now you are free to be whoever you want, but you love your master. You love your master so much, you go, I could be free to do whatever I want, but you're amazing. The things you give me, the things you teach me, the person I'm becoming, I don't want to leave your household. I want you. And if, that, and, and, and if that's what they want, you know what they do? This is awesome. They come and take you to the doorpost of the, of the house, take out a nail, and drive the nail through your ear. They put an earring in, and now in every place you go, everyone knows that you are a bond slave of a master. Paul says, where else would I go? Where else would I find my joy, my peace, my meaning? Where else would I find true? It's God. I will willingly let you be my Lord. Drive the nail through. Some people wonder why I wear an earring. 
I forget I have it on, actually. I really do. It's been in there so long. And it's not because I'm cool. <laughs> oh, yeah. Or I'm just so hip and so young. You, after so many years of gray hair, that just does not work, right? All right. I'm a bond slave of Jesus. Doesn't mean everybody has to get an earring, okay? It's just my thing, right? I've stood at the doorpost of his house and said, I don't want to go anywhere else. I want to serve you the rest of my life. Drive the nail through. I want the world to know. <laughs> Sorry, got a little emotional there. I'm good. I'm good. I'll move on. So to understand the story of freedom, instead of freedom from tyranny, which is, which is the world, uh, with freedom, I, I mean biblical freedom, we, we want to get freedom from tyranny and evil, to freedom to do whatever I want, if that, that little switch is going to help us with the next thing that shapes us. That was a long introduction, but here we're, we're going to get to this thing, and it's going to be a little bit of a switch of, of brain. Okay, we're, we're going to take a jump. I didn't know how to do a good transition. I'm going to take some water. That will be my transition. All right, here we go. The next thing that shapes us are habits. Habits form our heart. Habits, habits form our heart. I want you to imagine a lifetime of ca cultivating a habit of gratefulness. Have you ever been around old people that are grateful? This is just like refreshing. Like, oh, I, I was cultivating a habit of joy. I, 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 I was listening to this book about this blind woman going to a, uh, uh, a nursing home. And she, as she was being wheeled, wheeled up the hallway, the orderly was saying, oh, your room is beautiful. It's got a big window, lots of light, and, and this is the color. The, the walls are all yellow. And, and he's describing it to her because she wouldn't be able to see it. And as, as she's, you know, go, going up, she says, oh, I am so blessed. I am so lucky to have such a beautiful room. And he said, you'll never see it. She said, I know. But I can see it in my heart, and it's beautiful. Been around those people? There's, there's not many of them. But this woman has had a lifetime of the habit of, of joy, of gratefulness. Now, now, I don't want to spend much time on this one. Do you imagine a habit, a lifetime habit of complaining? Now, complaining is fun, isn't it? Come on, it's a little bit of a release. Those people at work, nah, 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 right. And they deserve it because whatever you complain about is true, isn't it? Amen. And then the family, oh, the extended family, oh, my, nah, 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 right? And, and why, you know, what's dinner conversation? What, what, what do you talk about if you can't complain? I, I, yeah, all right? Okay. Imagine a whole lifetime of the habit of complaining. Can you imagine what that person would be like? You know them already, don't you? <laughs> Imagine a whole lifetime of lust. What that would do to your brain, to a relationship. Imagine a whole, imagine a whole t lifetime of envy. The thing is, our character is shaped by our habits. I remember uh, seeing some old folks in my church where I grew up. Uh, there's this one woman who had smile wrinkles. Have you, you know, smile wrinkles? And I saw that and I go, I want smile wrinkles. I don't want a curmudgeon face, you know? So whenever I suntan, I go like that. No, anyway. <laughs> habits form our hearts. Habits form our hearts. Our character is shaped by our habits. We know this through neuroplasticity plasticity in our brains. I love talking about brains. I, you know, if you're new here, a bio major, I, I get into this more than, than the average person, that we have a billion neurons in our brain, all packed together. Isn't that amazing? If that isn't a miracle, I remember a Science Magazine article said the greatest miracle in the universe is what we all carry on our neck. Anyway, we got a billion, a billion neurons in our brain. And, and each of those have little dendrites that, that go off and connect to other neurons. And uh, I, I did biology, you know, okay, so I drew, the, I drew the cell, 
you know, with the axion and the dendrites and the cell body. If you ever took, you know, taken biology 101. And the little dendrites I drew like about four or five. <laughs> okay. The average brain cell does not have four or five connections to other nerves. They have anywhere from 10,000 to 100,000 connections. One cell. Like this is a massive connection. You know what? Those connections, they, they grow. And, and they, they, they shrink. That's happening in your brain right now. It's like, okay. They're all growing in different places. You go, what? Yes, your brain is plastic. It's moving. It is a miracle. In, in, in fact, the very structure of our brains are shaped by our habits. In fact, they, have, <laughs> they did this uh, actually to dead people, not to alive people. But they found out that musicians have heavier brains than an average person. Why? Because there's a whole area of your, your head that you don't usually use. And so, so many more connections come. So here's the question. If our habits shape us, if, if, if that's the case, and if it's actually a physical part of our body, it's hard to change a habit. Isn't it? Can we be, just be honest? I'm not going to get up here and say, oh, form a new habit. No, it's hard. Your brain is actually being wired in the habits you already have. Here's as one writer said this, we, we may know exactly why an action is bad or undesirable. It's not, <laughs> it's, you're not educated to, to make this better. We know exactly why an action is bad or undesirable. We can tell ourselves that over and over, but that part of the brain is actually the part that gets shut out when autopilot habits turn on. In fact, so when you go, I shouldn't do this, I shouldn't do this, I shouldn't do this, but you do it anyway, you do it anyway, you do it anyway. Okay, anybody who scrolls late at night knows this, right? Can we be honest here? All right? All right, all right. Okay, as you scroll, you go, I should get to bed now. I should get to sleep now. Just a couple more. Whoa, I didn't know that was happening in their life. <laughs> Wow, that's interesting. Wow, that was so funny. The cat, the cat. The cat one's getting me. So no one needs to educate me to say, Dave, you could put that down now because that's not helping. That's not new information. It's the super highways I'm building in my brain that work against that. So how do we do this? How do we let good habits get formed in our lives? Well, I'm going to introduce you to an idea put out by monks, by, by ancient monks. I've got one of the, their rules, rules of St. Benedict, all right? The ancient monks, all right, had talked about spiritual formation, where it's formed spiritually through spiritual disciplines. Uh, monks lived by rules, Benedictine monks, uh, Augustinian monks. When I was in university, I got into it. I, got, I, I had a, a monk's robe, and I thought being a monk would be so cool until I found out they're celibate. Then I didn't like that. All right. Uh, a, a monk, they have rules. And, and the rules, like, plan out your day. Okay. St. Benedict, here we go. Here we go. A lodge in ordinary days. Lodge should be celebrated on ordinary days as follows. Psalm 66 and Psalm 67 shall be chanted without antification on Sunday. Slowly as though all... Okay, it, so on Sundays, you know what psalm you're going to read. Here's another one. Here's another one. I just opened this randomly. Chapter 15. Seasons during which Alleluia is chanted. So, so you know what's going to happen. They, they made out rules for life. They made out rules. So their mornings were regulated. Prayers were, were regulated. They didn't have to think about it. The Old Testament saints also had things similar. They prayed three times a day. They went to the temple and prayed three times a day. Nine o'clock in the morning, noon, and 3 p.m. You find out when Peter went to the temple, he said he went for afternoon prayers. Why? Because they didn't have to think about it. Everybody knew 3 o'clock in the afternoon, you're hitting the temple to pray. That's just what you do. This is a habit. This is something that you don't have to think about. This is something that you don't say, well, maybe I will, maybe I won't. No, you just hit afternoon 3 
and prayers. In the Old Testament, there are, there are festivals. Three were required that the, that the children of Israel had to come to Jerusalem. And not only that, you had to sing the Psalms of Ascent going up to Jerusalem. There are Psalms 120 to 134. If you look at the book of Psalms and you read Psalm 120 to 134, it'll say Psalms, Psalms of Ascent. That's because Jerusalem's on a hill, Mount Zion. And as you are ascending up, these are the Psalms that you sing. You don't think about it. You don't wonder about it. You don't know what you're going to talk about. Hey, let's complain on the way up. No, we're actually going to be singing these Psalms on the way up. The idea of the monastic rule came from the, uh, the name trellis. Trellis. The rule came from the Latin word for trellis. A trellis is something rigid and ungiving. And I got one up here. This is a trellis, kind of. Really cool church shape. All right. The idea is you put a plant on the bottom. The plant is alive and moving. And, and, and the cool thing is if you have a trellis in your life, the tr plant moves, it, it, it moves all over the place and grows but it's up off the ground. And it, it's on something that's solid. The plant itself moves all over the place. But something about being solid gives it life. It exposes it to the light. It helps it grow instead of taking away growth. And so the monks talked about having these, these rules, these trellises. We bristle at the idea of a rule, a schedule, a discipline. I do. If anybody is skewed more for freedom, it's me. I am there. Talk to our staff members. I don't even like, you know, no, I'm, I find it hard to evaluate them. You go and do what, what you want to do. Be free. Be free. Why? Because I am free. Right? I, I'm, I live my life thinking that all limits ruin freedom. Philosophers James Smith argued in a book called uh, "What <laughs> You Are, What You Love, The Spiritual Power of Habits, that there is slavery to freedom. He said what happens are if we're totally free to make up any decision we want, there's this overwhelming options that come and we have all the... Hello, are we still here? <laughs> I didn't have a heart attack. No, this is a time when I preach about the Lord coming back, right? <laughs> Repent. <No. laughs> Boom. <laughs> oh, I'm not sure what happened, but uh, okay. Our tech guys are, are looking at each other. Okay, awesome. <laughs> back to the message, all right? The overwhelming options overwhelm us and fatigue us, and sometimes we make bad decisions, wrong decisions decision, or we make no decision at all because I just can't figure out what I'm supposed to do. I have too many options. Uh, the philosopher said, all, so sometimes the, uh, too many options blind us to what's best. And he says this, this is his quote, which I should have up on a wall somewhere. The good life does not, doesn't come from having the ability to do what we want, but from having the ability to do what we're made for. That should be the mic drop. I should have said that earlier. I'm going to read it again because it's so good. Here we go. Here we go. The good life doesn't come from having the ability to do what we want, but from having the ability to do what we're made for. We're made for. As Richard Foster says, the pers purpose of spiritual disciplines is liberation from the stifling slavery to self-interest. Does this seem too oppressive? Can I just say there's no one that's surrendered more than Jesus? All-powerful God became helpless infant. He spoke the world into existence, and yet he became a babe where no word could come out of his mouth. Philippians chapter 2 tells us what this is like. Philippians 2, 6. Though he was God, talking about Jesus, he did not think equality with God something to cling to. Instead, hear the words. Hear these words. He gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave. A slave was born as a human being, and when he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God. I'm just going to do what you say, Father. I'm not here to do my own thing because I know your plans, your things are just best for me, best for the world. 
humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on the cross. Therefore, it just really worked out bad. No, therefore, God <laughs> elevated him to a place of highest honor and gave him the name above all other names. Okay, so what does this look like in our schedule? This is what we're going to do. We're going to do, do some take home. Here we go. What does this look like for us? You, we want to be shaped. We want to be shaped. So let's start building habits. If you're young and idealistic, don't do all kinds of them. Just start slow. Start one. Start building one habit in your life. Maybe two habits in your life. But start to say, hold on. This is a trellis. I'm going to start to build some godly habits in my life. And so I can be free and grow. But I can get off the ground. I can have life. And, and life can be poured into me because I have some things that are immovable in my life. Uh, just to let you know, none of these spiritual disciplines make God love you anymore. He loves you no matter what you do. Isn't that awesome? It is. It is. He, because you're a child of God. It's not like, you know, you have a kid and they go, wow, they're not putting away their toys, all this. You still love them, right? Why? Why? Because they're your child. If you're a child of God, he just loves you. Period. Right? These things don't make him love you more. This is about being shaped. Here is a list of some various ones you might want to try. I, I'm not making these. I, all these things aren't something I, I do. Uh, I, I just I went and figured out what various people do. I read about one person that just, just turns off their cell phone at 10 p.m., not just sets it aside, turns it off. Oh, my goodness, that gives some of us the shakes already. Some people have date nights. That's... The, well, what about the spontaneous? <laughs> Just build a trellis, right? Build a trellis. Some pray on their knees every single morning. Something about getting down on your knees, they're going to do that. It's, you, you make up your own spiritual disciplines. Like, this is the fun part. This is like a, a do-it-yourself, right? Do-it-yourself spiritual disciplines. This is something I, I, I'm going to look forward to next week is is talking about in small groups. What are some spiritual disciplines that you think that you'd like to put in your life? I, I'm going to suggest two real fast here, real fast. And this one, this one I would call a keystone habit in, uh, in the book called uh, uh, the, the Amazing Power of Habits. It talks about keystone habit. A keystone habit is a micro shift that brings about macro effects. If you do this one habit, it has all kinds of spinoff, all kinds of spinoffs. All right, here it is. And, and again, if you don't do this, I, I don't love you less. God doesn't love you less. I really, and I, I'm sort of loath to kind of suggest spiritual habits. But here's one, okay? Here we go. I need to have a drink before I do this. Go to church every Sunday. You figured I'd say that, wouldn't you? Yeah, you figured I'd say that. That's self-serving. If you don't like this church, go to another one. Just go somewhere. Every so often somebody leaves Church on the Rock, and I go, I hope you're going somewhere, because that's a win. It's not about Church on the Rock. It's just this thing called a gathering. I grew up going to church all the time, except when I was sick on holidays. It, it, was just, it was just what we did. I didn't think about it because it was a habit. In fact, it's a good thing because it's actually a command of God. Hebrews 10, 24 to 25. Let's think about ways to motivate one another to acts and love of, of love and good works. How do we do that? Let's not neglect our meeting together. That meeting together is actually epi, epi synagogue. Let, let's, let's go. Let's go to the, this, these meetings, uh, as some people do, but encourage one another, especially as the day of his return is drawing near. There is so many things that happen when you just attend church. Number one, the discipline of worship happens. You go, okay, I need to have the discipline of worship in my life. If you don't go to church, that's just hard to do because you're going to forget to do it. Maybe I will do it. Maybe we'll turn on some worship music. Maybe I won't. I'm not really into it. But going to church forces you to get into the discipline of worship. It forces you into the discipline of confession. We have a communion table. And we open it up every week, and we ask you to go back there, and you hold the little communion cup, and you say, okay, God, is there anything I need to confess to you to get my life 
like our relationship straight together. Is there anything I need to confess? And he taps you, and you confess it. If you don't have that regular thing in your life, how do you have the discipline of confession? Maybe you have it other ways. But you see how it's a keystone thing. One discipline just cascades the discipline of reading Scripture. I know some people, ah, I try and do that every week. I know. Guess what? You're going to get some when you go to church. The discipline of listening to God. Because after I'm done speaking, I invite you to go and listen to God. Children, it just teaches them what's important. They don't know. They're concrete thinkers. You say, God's important, God's important, God's important. They don't get that unless they, they concretely do something to see where God is important. It opens you to the possibility to be used in the life of others to encourage it it opens you to the possibility of speaking into you and praying for you there's just one attitude i think you should always come to church with it's an attitude of anticipation or hope god is going to do something here god is going to do something here there's a sign that you come by and i made it up for this reason it's not just a sign that you pass by this is actually a spiritual discipline i want you to do as you pass that sign by it says anticipate god's goodness when you go by that sign i want you to okay god we're on this is game day i want you to come and work in my life i'm ready for this i don't feel like it i'm feeling nasty today all right i'm feeling nasty and that getting the kids today was just not a good thing but God, I want to anticipate your goodness. So I'm, just, I'm, I'm going to come with that attitude. And imagine a lifetime of hanging your hat on this. How your life would be different if you decided not to. So to go it alone. Again, I will love you no matter what. And God will love you no matter what. I just think it's a good spiritual discipline. We're going to talk about the uh, spiritual discipline of fasting and praying. I have up there fast and pray at least once a year. Probably should be more than that. Jesus fasted, we know, for 40 days. John the Baptist and the disciples asked Jesus, why don't your disciples fast? And Matthew, in, uh, Jesus said, Matthew 9, 15, but sometime the groom will be taken away from them. Then they will fast. Then we're going to do that. In Matthew chapter 6, he gives us actual descriptions on how to fast. And he says this, and when you fast, isn't that awesome? Don't make it obvious, as hypocrites do, for they try and look miserable and disheveled so people would admire them for their fasting. I tell you the truth, <laughs> that is the only reward they'll ever get. But when you fast, comb your hair, wash your face. By the way, that should be happening anyway, okay, every day. <laughs> Some of you need to know that. All right, uh, and, and then no one will notice your fasting except your father, who knows what you do in private. Come on, come on, let's read this at the end. And, the, and your father, who sees everything, well, what would it, let's, let's all say these three things, these three words at the end together, right? One, two, three. Will reward you. Isn't that a good thing? Like, count me up. Count me on. I, I, I'm, yeah. This is great. This is voluntarily put something over, the, putting God over something. I love you more. It reminds me of a, 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 a scene I saw in Friends. If you've never seen Friends, this will, yeah, this will pass over you. But uh, uh, Joey is sitting in a cafe, and he comes back, and, and his girlfriend that he's on a date with has taken a bite of his sub. And, and you know, the angst he is, do I love the girl or the sub more? And as you watch Friends, you know that's a, a running thing, you know. With, and so in the same way, the <laughs> same way, we go, okay, God, uh, okay, I'm not going to eat this meal. Why? I love you more. I'm going to turn this app off. Woo! Woo, baby. It's like snorting Tabasco. Because I love you more. That's a fun spiritual discipline. I'm not going to tell you, you know, how or when, but that's why we do this year after year, is I want you to get a taste of it again, to be reminded of it again, that maybe God might drop that in your in, in, in your whole life somehow. There's hunger prompts. Oh, man, I could have some cooking. No, 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 I'm not doing that this afternoon. That hunger prompt now prompts you to pray. God, I love you more than cookies. Wow. I just went up on the list. <laughs> I love you more than TikTok. Woo. Yeah, come on. Those hunger prompts. I'm going to ask our worship team to come on up. Now, now, here's, 
This is not legalism, again. God doesn't love you more. This is about being on a trellis so you have life. You might not like the two disciplines I suggested. Make up your own. <laughs> Make it fun. But to say, okay, hold on. What would it be like if I had a lifetime of saying thank you to God for food? But expanding that into a prayer of gratefulness for at least one other thing. What would a lifetime be like if I said, thank you, God, for the food? Uh, or, you know, rub a dub dub, thanks for the grub. Thank you. God, I'm going to thank you for something else. What would a lifetime of habit, how would that shape your heart? How would that shape your heart? As Richard Foster says, the pur purpose of the disciplines is liberation from the stifling slavery of self interest. So my question I'm going uh, to drop you with is this. I want you to spend some time listening to God as we worship, as you're in the prayer corner at the communion table, and say, what are my do-it-yourself disciplines? What, what would be fun if you uh, are in a relationship? Why don't you talk about it as a couple? Uh, don't make it, you know, don't put everything down, but start to talk about, God, what kind of trellis can I build in my life that my spiritual life can grow off the ground and flourish. And you can shape me. Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you for the gathering where we can worship and hear you. Come and do work in our hearts. Because you are alive. You are real. And you are life-giving. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.